Year One. That is something we've been talking about for several weeks. I'm going to wrap up that series of talks today, but next weekend will be our Do For One weekend. I'm so excited about it. Let me, let me start our talk today with a question for you. Um, I want you to tell me, are you, I just want to make sure we're on kind of maybe the same page. Do you have like a favorite, maybe it's one or two different types of movies that you really like? Anybody got like their favorite movie or maybe there's a series that you really like? Anybody? Yes? Let me see your hands. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Okay, so one of my favorite movies is, um, it's a series of movies called Rocky. Um, I don't know if you remember these movies, but I, I loved them. And uh, I started watching them when I was younger, and I just I couldn't get enough of it. So, you know, I, I got to thinking about something. This is, uh, this is Rocky. There's two guys in the picture. Rocky really had um, two major uh, people that supported him in the series. Uh, there, were, there were some along the journey that supported him. But you know, if you know anything about the Rocky series, the guy on the left right there is his trainer named Mickey. And I say it all the time. I'll say to people, hey, today I want to be your Mickey, or, or you've been my Mickey today. Some people look at me like I'm really weird, but this is what I'm referring to. I don't know if you know this, but in this picture, one of his greatest support roles is the other guy on the right. You may not know who that is. Anybody know who it is? That's his dad. His father is the gentleman back to the right who was in this, uh, this movie shot, and they just played these incredible roles of support to an actor and for the role that he played called Rocky. So I don't know if you have those kind of people in your life, but here's what I want to do today. I want to be a Mickey to you today. Not Mickey Mouse, but Mickey the trainer. I want to pour some water in your face. I want to rub your shoulders, clean you up a little bit, because we're in a battle. And so I want to use these next few minutes to be your Mickey. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was um, watching um, a football game and uh, enjoying a football game, and there was this commercial that came on that just, oh, man, I loved it. And every time it came on, I'd turn the volume up. I was, so it was a car commercial. I don't, I don't own one of these cars. Maybe you do. It was a Lexus commercial. And, uh, and it was about this woman riding her bike, and her husband is trailing her, because I've done this before. I was the person on the bike and my wife was trailing me in the car. And just, I love it when we can come alongside of people and be an encouragement to them. How many of you have had somebody in your journey that has been an encouragement to you? Let me see your hand. Some of you have not. Okay, so today I'll be your encourager. Maybe you've been an encouragement to somebody. I want to do that over these next few moments because here's what I think. I think there's times that we come to church and we leave this place and we've had somewhat what I'll just call a mountaintop or a summit experience. Like we've arrived at the top, this long climb, this incredible journey, and Sunday for many people is while we arrived, we've had this incredible summit moment. And we leave here and we go right back out into the reality of the world, and it can be a beatdown sometimes. So over these next few moments, I want to be your encourager of what God's doing in your life. Now, I want us to think less about Sunday being the summit and more like, if you're familiar with climbing, more like base camp. It's kind of that halfway point. This is where the food is, this is where the nourishment is, this is where the rest is, this is where we gather back the supplies, make sure everybody's okay. So you're coming into an environment today, I just want to make sure everybody's okay, and that on your journey, you can be encouraged over these next few moments. So I think you kind of get where I'm going today. Now, let me show you how this happened in Scripture. Acts chapter 10, the book of Acts not spelled with an X, but A-C-T-S, the Acts of the Apostle, not an Acts that God used. The Acts of the Apostles in the 10th chapter, the launch of the church has happened, and now the spread of Christianity or the gospel is taking place. In the 10th chapter is where I'm going to land today. We're going to read a portion of Scripture. We're going to talk about this portion of Scripture and how it applies to our life. So if you've got a smartphone, and you've not downloaded the Bible app. You need to do that. 
If you've got your smartphone, follow along in Acts 10. You can highlight it in there. If you've got your uh, bulletin from today, there's a place to take notes. There's a couple of spots that I'll say to you, man, this is something you're going to want to write down to remember because today I'm your Mickey. Today I'm pouring some water in your face. You're sitting down for just a few minutes so I can be your encourager in the journey today. So Acts chapter 10, the New Testament church has begun. It's the first century, and there's going to be an exchange of two guys that do not know each other, but God's going to bring them together and make an incredible introduction. So here we go, verse number one. Acts chapter 10, the word of God says this, in Caesarea there lived a Roman officer army officer named Cornelius. Now, just to give you a, a little bit of backdrop there, this means this, this role would have been the equivalent of maybe an army officer today in our context. So uh, there's this Roman army officer named Cornelius. Say Cornelius. Okay, you got to know that name because this is one of the guys today. Cornelius. Anybody in the room called named Cornelius? All right, no Cornelius is in the room today. Cornelius was, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. In other words, he had leadership over about a hundred men. So he had a number of men under his leadership, about a hundred of them. So Cornelius, captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout or faithful, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. Now, let's press pause. We're going to talk about this passage as we walk through it. Cornelius sounds like a pretty good guy, doesn't he? So normal, army officer type of guy, and if you've got any military background, or maybe you grew up in a military home, you know what that home life would have been like. So Cornelius, an officer, about 100 men under his leadership, is a God-fearing man. He gives to the poor like many of us in this room, we give generously, and he prayed to God. The interesting thing you need to know about Cornelius is, and and I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can, in the first century, when you're reading the Bible, so if you're not familiar with the Bible, this will help you. When you read the Bible, or you hear somebody like me talk, this will help you. Really, there's going to be two classifications of people. There are the Jewish people, And there's something called the Gentile people. Now, that's as simple as I can make it. Two different groups of people. You were either Jewish or you were Gentile. So if you weren't Jewish, you were Gentile. Does that make sense? Whether you agree with it or not, that's really kind of the way that the Bible is written to describe the Jewish people, which were known as God's chosen people. They would have known this. Cornelius is not of that group. He's a Gentile, but he gives to the poor, God-fearing guy, prays, and his whole household does. So, sounds like a pretty good guy, sounds like a pretty good home, so hopefully you've got the understanding. About three o'clock in the afternoon one day, verse number three, Cornelius had a vision. Maybe you've experienced visions before. He had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Hey, Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What would you do? I mean, if you've got a vision and all of a sudden an angel of God stands in front of you and goes, Fran! Yeah, fear might set in. Cornelius Stares at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, quote, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to send some men to Joppa. Joppa is about 32 miles along the coastline of the Mediterranean. It's a seashore city. I want you to send some men down to Joppa. Remember why they're sending men? Because he's got men under his leadership. He's like an army officer. So he's got about 100 men. I want you to send some men down to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. Now, there's a name we're familiar with. Have you been around 
the Bible or Christianity, you've heard of a guy named Simon Peter, or Peter, as we commonly refer to him. I want you to go down to Joppa because there's a guy there by the name of Simon Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner. So you hear the word Simon twice in there. Make sure you can distinguish. We're talking about two different guys. Simon the Tanner, he's a Hawaiian tropic model. He wears, uh, he's a tanner, so not really. He's a guy that specializes in leather goods. Just want to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> Simon Peter is staying with Simon the Tanner, leather goods guy, who lives near the seashore. So, let's make sure that we got the picture. It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, there's significance to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is the time that the Jewish people would press pause in the middle of their day and pray. But Cornelius isn't Jewish. And so in the middle of the afternoon at 3 o'clock, when good Jewish people would pause and pray to their God lifting up their voice to God, at 3 o'clock, God lifts up his voice to Cornelius, Gentile. I love that piece of this. And he says to him, listen, I want you to get some men. I need you to head down to Joppa. There's a guy there named Simon Peter. He's staying at a buddy of his named Simon the Tanner. I need you to go down there, and uh, I I want you to ask him something. Now, in verses 17 through 15 of the, this chapter, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of the backdrop. Simon, a few days later, Simon Peter, so the vision has been given to Cornelius. He's terrified. The angel said, hey, go down there. Simon uh, Peter is at Simon. The tanner's house summons him. Well, a few days go by. And Simon Peter, it's about lunchtime. Again, this is verses 17 through 15. About lunchtime, Simon Peter goes to the rooftop where he's living, Simon the Tanner's home. He goes to the rooftop at lunchtime to pray. This was another time for them to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times when I'm praying or I'm in the middle of a conversation and I get hungry. Now, it's interesting that this is the time that he goes to the rooftop while he's hungry at lunchtime to the rooftop to pray. And it's during this time that an interesting exchange takes place. Simon Peter on the roof has a vision. Just as Cornelius has had a vision, had an angel from God, now Peter is going to have a vision. So he's on top of this roof. It's about lunchtime, and he has a vision. And in his vision, God lowers a blanket or a white sheet in some translations. God lowers a white sheet in the vision. And Peter sees the white sheet. Again, you can read all of this in the 10th chapter. Last week, I had a a live animal on stage with me. But for sake of live animals, I brought some friends with me, some other animals. (laughs) And on this sheet is a bunch of animals. They, They weren't you know, plastic cartoon animals. He's looking at the vision of a white sheet coming down with all these animals. And Scripture says he's perplexed by this. Hmm, this is interesting. What's up with the sheet? What's up with all the animals on the sheet? It's lunchtime. I'm a little hungry, but those animals are not appealing to me because I'm a good Jewish guy. And good Jewish guys don't eat those kinds of animals. Again, I'm letting you in on this passage by giving you some backdrop on how this would have went down. And so Peter sees this white sheet coming down. He's having this vision in the middle of his prayer time. 
And he sees these animals of which he knows, according to Jewish law, he's forbidden to eat those. You and I don't live under the same type of law, but Peter, the fisherman, understood Jewish law. He's also been a disciple of Jesus. And he sees these animals and he thinks, I'm not allowed to eat these animals. Now, in the vision, he's told, and I quote, it's okay to kill and eat. Peter is like, what? From the time I was a little boy, this was off limits. I've never eaten anything, and there's a key word in these verses. I've never eaten anything unclean. Again, we don't live in a culture quite like this. But Peter is having a difficult time with this. What does the vision mean? What do you mean, kill and eat? I'm Jewish. We don't eat this stuff. Peter, at this point, is processing his Jewish conviction and beliefs. He's trying to understand, what is this vision? What does it mean to me? Because I've got this conviction in me that I can't participate I can't kill and eat. And he's in the middle of praying. So the vision is coming from God. I've never done anything like this, Peter's thinking. And now you're asking me, God, to violate the convictions that have been instilled in me through my forefathers, my grandfather, my dad, all the way through. I've I've been discipling other people, and now all of a sudden you're changing the game on me. Verse 15, so Peter's in the middle of praying, vision is happening, white sheet comes down with animals on it, verse 15, but the voice spoke again, Peter, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. Hmm. Man, what does this vision mean? Just then, the men sent by Cornelius. Remember what the angel said. Hey, Cornelius, gather some of your men. I want you to go summon a guy named Simon Peter down at Simon the Tanner's house. So at the same moment at noontime, he's, he's, he's hungry for lunch. He has this vision. He's wrapping up three times. He sees the same vision, and as he wraps it up, he hears, there's been some men sent by Cornelius, and they found Simon's house. Standing outside Simon the Tanner's home, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Here's what the Holy Spirit said to Peter. He's on the rooftop. Three guys are out at the gate. They've come to get him. He doesn't know these guys. He doesn't know they're coming. Hey, three men, the Holy Spirit says, three men are looking for you. Go up or get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, Peter. I've sent them. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read something like this, It seems a little odd to me. He's on the rooftop. He's got this vision he's trying to process. Scripture says, perplexed by it. Oh, and by the way, there's some guys down at the gate. They've come to get you. And uh, wherever they're going to take you, I want you to just go with them. So Simon Peter comes off the rooftop, goes down the steps, and he greets these guys. So here is a good Jewish man being greeted by some of the regiment of Cornelius who are saying, hey, we want you to go with us. And again, I thought long and hard, how do I describe the difference in first century between Jews and Gentiles? It's really difficult for us. Because I think in our generation, we are experiencing racial divide 
at epic pro proportion. However, I think this was way beyond anything we've ever seen. Part of that is, in my opinion, when you read Scripture, part of this comes from this sense of entitlement that the Jewish people felt they had as God's chosen people. As if everyone else is less than us because we're God's chosen people. Now, do they have God's favor through the corridor of time? Absolutely. But now all of the sudden, Jesus has died on a cross, buried, rose again, spent some time with his disciples, goes back to heaven, leaves them behind. Peter is one of them. And now the spread of the message of what Jesus has done is happening. And here is a portion of the spread of the good news of the gospel. Peter is on the rooftop. Cornelius has had this direction given to him in the middle of a vision. And the angel has told him to go get him. But there is such a difference between the Jews and the Gentiles. And here, in verses number 24 through 33, you find in Acts chapter 10, Peter then travels back with the guys. He shows up at Cornelius' home. Are you guys still here? Are you still ready? You're, you're listening and awake? All right. <clears throat> um, and so he arrives back at Cornelius' home, and there's an interesting exchange that takes place. Now, we don't know how Peter got there. Let's just say he rode a camel. And Peter rides his camel up to Cornelius' home. He gets off the camel. He walks up to the front door. And we got to know a couple of things about this because if you're reading Acts chapter 10 about this story, you may miss some of the details if you don't know the backdrop of this. Jewish law forbid him to go into his home. So... Peter is in process, perplexed by, what is this? But in the journey, God has begun to reveal to him, kill and eat what it means. And now, standing at Cornelius' home, Peter, the outsider, Cornelius is a Gentile. In these verses, Scripture, if you, you, starting in verse number 28, if you read it, it says that Cornelius invited all of his family and all of his friends to come to the home because he just knows an angel of God showed up and said, put some men on the road, go 32 miles to the south, and go bring Simon back to me. Simon Peter. So Cornelius wants everybody to know, what's this about? Why is it that we're supposed to bring this guy? And here's what that exchange looked like. When Peter walks through the gate and, opens, and the door is opened up and there's a greeting, Cornelius immediately falls down on his knees and begins to worship Peter. Peter says something like this. And again, you can go back and read it in chapter 10. Peter says something like this. Dude, get up. You ready? I'm a human just like you. There's no need to worship me. Get up. Now, Scripture says there was some exchange that took place. There was a conversation, a greeting that took place, some introductions that took place. But can you imagine how awkward and uncomfortable this must have been? Peter's had a vision. Cornelius has had one. Now, what was it all about? Why are we here? What is it that we're supposed to be doing? And Cornelius says in verse number 33, so I sent for you at once, and it was good of you to come. Hey, Peter, I just want you to know how challenging I know this is for you. Our people don't hang out. Your peeps aren't my peeps. And I know that we're a Gentile home, and from what I understand, you're not even supposed to be here. So I just want you to know, Peter, thank you. Now... <clears throat> If we read verse 33 of chapter 10, sometimes I think we can just process right through the passage and fully miss the rich truth of it. Because Cornelius is identifying that I know this is out of your comfort zone. I know this is awkward. I know this is not what you had hoped you would be doing. But all I can tell you is an angel of God spoke to me. and He told me to send some of my men to go get you and bring you here. 
And Peter's going, well, you know, that's weird. I had this vision too. And in my vision, I saw this white sheet coming down, and there was a bunch of animals. And the voice said, kill and eat. I was perplexed, and then your guys showed up. So they're exchanging what all has happened. And then Peter begins to describe to Cornelius about his vision. Because everybody around the house is going, okay, why are you here? What do you have to say? This isn't simply just a photo op to put Cornelius and Simon Peter together. Why are you here? And Simon Peter begins to describe to him. Verse 33, the end of 33 says, Now we're all here. We're waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Peter replied, verse 34, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. Now the reason he's saying this is because in verses 24 through 33, in the description of the exchange when they meet each other, Peter is describing that he now understands what his vision was. And I'm going to say it in as simple a terms as I can. What we Jewish people thought that God was exclusive to us alone, God has now said, I'm available to all mankind. Whether you're a Jew or you're a Gentile, everyone is welcome into the family of God. That's the simplest way I can say it. So regardless of what your religious backdrop is, regardless of what your upbringing has been, if you've kept Jewish law or not kept Jewish law, everyone is now welcome. And Peter begins to describe this to Cornelius. Peter replied, I can see clearly now. God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. Now, you can just imagine Simon Peter's humility because this is a guy that has upheld Jewish law his whole life. Now, all of a sudden, he is being told from God, hey, I'm going to break all of that tradition. What you've seen as your religion, the tradition of your religion, I'm now going to reveal to you that I, what I have done through my son Jesus, has been made available to all. And the message to Cornelius, his family, and his friends, the Gentile people, is that Jesus is available to you. And God wanted Cornelius, who gave generously to the poor, prayed fervently. He wanted Cornelius to know, just because you're Gentile, just because you're not Jewish, you are welcome into my family. And this is an incredible moment in the life history of human history. In the life of the early church, this now opens up. Wow. There's something unique that God is doing. And Peter goes on to say this in verse 36. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. In other words, in all of Israel, in our homeland, Cornelius... The God of peace is available to all through Jesus Christ. It is the simple story of the gospel. Now, Pastor, you've explained Acts chapter 10 to us. What's the point for us? Well, in most situations in Scripture... This is one isolated passage. In most passages of Scripture, you find people that are constantly looking for a peace because there's something inside of them longing, yearning, and oftentimes they don't even know how to describe it. Cornelius was one of these guys. There is this longing in him for a peace that he didn't understand And so God speaks into the life of his servant, Simon Peter, and says, I want you to go and explain to him the good news of the gospel. Good news of the gospel is simply this. Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. No other human being has ever lived this life without sin other than Jesus. And as a result of sinless life, he was put on trial. The religious leaders of his day claimed that he had blasphemed, that he had spoken, I and God are one. 
And the religious leader said, we're having none of this. And he went to trial and eventually executed by way of crucifixion. We, we wear crosses on a necklace. We see crosses in a room. We see them in a song. We see them in images. The cross represents a bloody, gory death of a sinless man who died on a cross for you and I. A price that we could not pay, Jesus became our substitute. And he went to the cross for you and I. This is the message that Simon Peter now delivers to Cornelius, his family, and all those who are listening. Which scripture said, they're a good family. They're a sincere family. They want to help people that are in need. And Cornelius is hearing for the first time what Jesus has done. Can I just make a real simple point? And if you are going to remember anything from this sermon today, here's what I'd want you to remember. God always uses people to reach people. Isn't that interesting? God always uses people to reach people. I love this fact about the way that God works. Because God, in all of the ways that we could describe him, has ultimate power. Could just go, I want you, and I want you, forget you, I want you, I don't want you, I want you, I don't want you. It's not the way God functions. God wants everyone. Everyone. Regardless of what nation you are growing up in, regardless of your economic position, regardless of a skin color, regardless if you're male or female, regardless of your past, God wants everyone. And here's how much we know, here's how we know that. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for all. And so in this text, one of the beautiful things that we see in here, and it's just one isolated text, that God chooses people to reach people. And by the way, all through Scripture, I started just making a list of them. The, uh, uh, Paul and Silas, Lydia and Paul, the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, Ananias to Saul, people like Nathaniel to Philip. I mean, all through the New Testament in, in the Bible, God uses someone to introduce them to him. Now, here's my point. There are more people that live in our county that don't know God than do. Who's going to tell them? I mean, I'm a church planting fan. I love church planting. I watch churches popping up all the time. I like the establishment of the church. My parents will ask questions of me. They're incredible Christians as well, living in Atlanta. And we'll have discussions like this. And with the movement of the mega church, how our city's not being transformed. Could it be that the church isn't being transformed? Could it be that we've become familiar with attending a service and leaving like we're on the mountaintop? rather than coming in and being massaged and water poured in our face so we can go back into the battle. Hmm. See, if God is going to use people to reach people, then what is your role in this? Well, I'm just a, a ninth grader. Well, I'm just a, a single college age working at my job. I'm just a a dad, I'm just a mom, I'm just a, a retired person. Whatever your season of life is, what is your role in the expansion of the gospel? Because again, in our region, let's just call it Lake County, roughly 85 to 90% would claim they are not connected to Jesus Christ. What's your role? What's my role? What is our role? Well, what if we do for one what we'd like to do for all? And I'd love to see, I think I said this a few weeks ago, what would our county look like if every single person were a believer? Crime would be gone. I mean, crime would be gone. 
racial division would be gone. God's no respecter of persons, and everybody's welcome. It's man that has put all of this nastiness into the world. I don't think there'd be any poverty if everybody were a believer. I don't think there'd be any. I don't think there'd be any homelessness in our county if the county were full of believers. And yet we sit on the greatest news known to mankind. Now, my task, your task, our task is not to convince anybody of anything. It's not our task. But our task is to remove some barriers so that people can hear the good news. See, when God spoke to Peter at noontime on top of the roof of Simon the Tanner's home, God wanted him to recognize there is a stumbling block in your life, if you will. There is a barrier between you and reaching people that are unlike you, non-Jewish people. So I'm going to remove this barrier. It's okay. Kill and eat. So that you can have relationship outside of your normal course of life and still tell people about the amazing journey of Jesus Christ. Here's what we believe. We believe that Jesus is the only one who can change anyone, and he's available to everyone. So if we really believe that, what are the barriers that we have that are keeping people from knowing him? I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. If you've been around me, you know I think about this stuff. I'm a demographic study guy, man. I I like to look at the demographics. I like to know the culture of where, where we're sitting today. There are more people disconnected from God in our lifetime than ever before. And at the same time, there is this movement of people that are saying, what can we do to re-evangelize this nation? We're one small piece called the fellowship, one expression that has the opportunity to take serious the commands to go and tell. So what will you do? What's your part? What's your role? How can you clear the path, if you will? Peter had to clear the path so that Cornelius, his family, and friends could understand they were welcome into the family of God. What do you need to do to clear the path? We've been saying for several weeks, uh, I started about 43 days ago in a sermon that I started called Do for One. And I asked you, if you would, to fill out a card if you know somebody in this area that needed Jesus Christ. And we'd begin to pray. Here's those cards. 262 cards. Been prayed over. Asking God, so what's your role? Because it's one thing to write a name on here. The name's Stephen. Stephen. Is the first card. Praying for Stephen and his girlfriend. What's your role in this? Because it's one thing to fill out a card. It's another thing to pray. It's another thing to invest in that relationship to invite them to Christ. How are you clearing the path? We said 43 days ago that 50 days from today, if we'd pray over these names and we would invest in these relationships and invite these people that we would do something unique on that Sunday, which is next Sunday, the 20th. And as the journey has gone, we discovered, I don't know that we'll hold everybody in this place if we're serious about reaching people for Jesus. I don't know that next Sunday we'll hold everybody. So we said, why don't we just offer a Saturday night service for all the people that serve in the life of our church. We'll do the exact same thing. Well, in the journey, then I started inviting people, and they would go, oh, well, I can come on Saturday, or I could come on Sunday, and so... We just said, let's do two identical services. Next weekend, we've never had a Saturday night service. Maybe you know somebody. I I, I read a statistic. Art actually sent me a statistic this week. 34% of Americans work on the weekends now. We've not seen that in our generation. 
So maybe they could come on a Saturday that were, as opposed to coming on a Sunday morning. So what we wanted to do was clear the path so that people could hear about Christ. But you and I got to get busy, man. We got to do our part. God was saying, Peter, I want to do for one, Cornelius, what I'd like to do for all. So, Peter, I want you to go to Cornelius' home and let him know that the gospel is available to him, his family, his friends, his nation, even though they're not in the Jewish heritage. Can I just say to you and I, church, who is that one person, that one family, that you just know, man, they need Jesus? Would you do your part? 